This is Ed Yarbrough. Today I am with Samuel Jackson McAllister III, better known as Mac, and he has practiced law in Tennessee for more than 50 years. Good afternoon, Mac. Good afternoon. Uh, you have had a very interesting career, but I want to start with some just some basic stuff. Tell us your date of birth. November 24, 1946. Where were you born? Chattanooga, Tennessee. Is that where you were raised up and educated? I was. I first lived on the side of Missionary Ridge in the first six years of my life, and then my parents moved to up Lookout Mountain, lived there all the way through college. Lookout Mountain is one of Tennessee's great landmarks. What was it like to live on Lookout Mountain? It was great. At uh, uh, Lookout Mountain, Tennessee is a very small area. Uh, we had our own uh, public elementary school. It was almost like a private elementary school because it's funded by the city of Lookout Mountain and the parents and uh, uh, easy to walk to uh, to school, ride your bike to school. Uh, my parents, my house that most of the time my parents were in were right on East Prowl Road, uh, fifth house from Point Park, and we overlooked the whole city of Chattanooga. So we were looking uh, out over the city of Chattanooga and uh, Moccasin Bend, everything below us. So it was a beautiful place. And when the weather got bad, what happened? It snowed. It, it would snow on Lookout Mountain. It was raining in Chattanooga. Were you ever stuck up there for a long period of time? We were. We had a we had a really bad ice storm. Don't remember exactly the time, but I was uh, I was uh, um, in high school at the time. Um, my father was out of town. He couldn't get home. They they uh, declared Lookout Mountain a disaster area because. Uh, Two out of every three trees were, were, were down. You couldn't even get along. My parent, my mother, myself, and my sister uh, lived in the house. We had, we had a coal fireplace, and we lived in, because electricity was off. So we kept warm, uh, putting coal in the fireplace and uh, uh, through the ice storm. And then it snowed at the end of the ice storm. Then we had, the next week, we had almost a foot of snow. Now, in order to live on Lookout Mountain, you must have uh, been part of a fairly prominent family. Is that right? I was. I'm third generation lawyer. My my grandfather uh, was uh, the first bankruptcy referee in Chattanooga, um, and uh, he had a law firm. He started in 1911. Uh, my father then joined him when he came back when he graduated from law school, and then again when he came back from the service. My Uncle Spears joined him, so it was McAllister McAllister, which was my grandfather's father and Uncle Spears. Now, there's your grand, is it your great-grandfather or your grandfather that's a famous uh, football player at UT? It's my grandfather. Tell us about him. He, uh, he he grew up in Chattanooga and went to University of Tennessee undergraduate. He played football. Uh, he was on the, the uh, football team. Um, in 1904, he was a fullback. Uh, he scored the winning touchdown the first time Tennessee beat Alabama, November 24, 1904. Um, they, the, the story goes, in fact, I've seen it in newspapers, so it's, it's a true story. It doesn't sound like a true story, but uh, they fitted him with a leather belt and uh, with two handles on the side. And the two, hand, two, two halfbacks grabbed the handles and threw him over the line of scrimmage. That's the way he scored. Uh, touchdowns were five points back then, so Tennessee won five to nothing. Now, how did he get his hands on the football? I, I guess the quarterback, somebody, maybe they centered it to him. I don't know. It, 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 the story never explained how that happened. <laughs> but he did have the football and went over the line. And so that's the famous human forward pass. Human forward pass was an article written by Sports Illustrated 75 years after the after in the anniversary of the, uh, of the, the win. Now, besides this football prowess, what else did your grandfather do that you remember? My grandfather was uh, was a big UT supporter after he graduated first. So after he graduated from uh, undergraduate school, uh, he came back to Chattanooga and he was a football coach at Baylor School, football coach University of Chattanooga, and going to the Chattanooga Law School at the time. Um, he graduated from the law school and started practicing law in 1911. Uh, he stayed at Baylor until they beat McCauley. He, he committed to Baylor until I beat McCauley. I'm going to stay here. He beat McCauley and then he went into private practice. <laughs> All right. Uh, now you, uh, I suppose, followed in his footsteps at Baylor. Is that right? Yes. Now he he was he did not go to Baylor. He was just a coach at Baylor. Okay. Uh, in Chattanooga, especially up on Lookout Mountain, it, it, your family, the ma males, uh, when they graduate, when they get through Lookout Mountain Elementary School, they either go to Baylor or go to McCauley. 
and you don't you don't mix. Uh, so my family were all Baylor. Of course, my grandfather being a teacher and a football coach at Baylor, uh, and my father and uncle both went to Baylor, and I went to Baylor too. What was that like going to high school at Baylor and Chattanooga back in those days? Oh, it was great. I loved it. It was an all boys military school, uh, seventh grade through twelfth grade. Uh, they kept you so busy you didn't have time to do anything else. The the bus would pick me up on Lookout Mountain about 6.30 in the morning. They dropped me at school at about quarter of eight. So classes would start at eight. Uh, then we'd get out of class at a quarter of two, which sounds, sounds a pretty good deal. Then we had chapel. Then we had military drill. Then we had required exercise. And the bus left at 5.15 to bring us back home. Um, and we were our instructors were instructed to give us at least three hours of homework every night. So I came home. My mother had food on the table. I ate and studied for three hours, went to bed, uh, started all over the next day. And in between, I had to polish my brass and polish my shoes and do all those things that you have to do at a military school. Now, I have to ask if this uh, regimen that you've just described had anything to do with what would become your work ethic as a lawyer. I think it has a lot to do with it. I had, had no spare time. I had learned how to use my time best. My, my father was a really hard worker. He was He's also a lawyer. And we'll talk. I guess we'll talk about him in a minute, but um, he worked six days a week. Um, my mother uh, was a secretary and at one time was also my father's uh, legal assistant or uh, secretary for some period of time. So they were both very familiar with the law and they both worked really hard all, all my life. I do want to go about your father. Tell us about him. My father um, uh, grew up on Lookout Mountain. That's where my grandfather's house was. And uh, he went to Baylor and then uh, went to University of Tennessee undergraduate. And he was an athlete. He was not the size my grandfather was. Uh, he was a very small man at that point in time, but he was a wrestler. So he was captain of the wrestling team. So he was a letterman at University of Tennessee, just like uh, my grandfather was. Uh, then went to University of Michigan Law School, graduated from University of Michigan Law School. Um, a year later, he, he married my mother, Carrie Davenport from Saudi, Tennessee. Um, and uh, for two years, uh, he went to practice law with my grandfather, and then he went to volunteer for the military at that point. Anything you want to say about the military history of either your father or your grandfather? Well, my grandfather was in World War I, but I don't know much about what he did in World War I. My, my father uh, went in as a private, volunteered, went to OCS, uh, was promoted to second lieutenant, gradually worked his way up to a captain. He was a company commander in the 80th Infantry Division, which was attached to Patton's Third Army. Um, interesting, they trained for two years in the United States before they went overseas. Um, they went over on the Queen Mary, which I found interesting. Uh, actually landed in Scotland the day uh, that uh, uh, we invaded um, Europe. D-Day. D-Day. Um, he didn't actually go ashore to about a month and a half later when his uh, 80th Division went ashore uh, at the Omaha Beach and mm -hmm. then fought alongside Patton uh, through France up and up into Germany. Did he get, get to the Rhine or do you know? He did. Did he cross the Rhine? I have an interesting book that the 80th Division, they, it's got a whole book of where they were each day. They, they were seeming like they were almost fighting almost, almost every day. They had active combat. Very interesting. Um, what about your military? You, did you uh, have any experience in that area? Very limited experience in that area. Uh, Tell us about it. Well, I was, again, military came really easy to me because of Baylor. Uh, I was in ROTC at UT, and then I uh, signed up for advanced ROTC, which paid me $50 a month, which was, which was welcome income back in those days, um, and to go on, to go in as a second lieutenant. Um, I was sworn as a second lieutenant when I graduated from undergraduate school. Um, I had a deferment to wait till after I uh, completed law school and took the bar exam before I went into active duty. Um, and then, I guess, fortuitously, um, Vietnam War was winding down at that point in time, and they had too many second lieutenants coming in. So uh, my whole group that were together, all of us were in law school, four or five of us were in law school together, uh, they gave half of the uh, second lieutenants the opportunity not to go into uh, long active duty, but to go into short three-month training and then eight-month active reserve. Uh, so I went to him and said, well, I just got out of uh, undergraduate school with, in business, and I just, I'm just now going to graduate from law school. 
and you transfer me to one of those divisions. The Army, in its infinite wisdom, because I was good in math, assigned me to artillery air defense, a Hawk missile officer. And they wouldn't do it. They were they were going to send me to Turkey for a 13-month unaccompanied tour, and I just got married to a so I graduated from law school, got married, uh, studied for the bar exam, took the bar exam, report, and reported for active duty at Fort Bliss, Texas, um, in April that year. Well, a lot going on. Yeah, a lot going on. Now, I failed to ask you about your, the rest of your family. Do you have brothers and sisters? I have a sister, Mary. She's six years younger than me, so she was always just that six years behind me. She, I, she, she started elementary school when I started high school. I consider her seventh grade being high school. Uh, she started uh, uh, high school, seventh grade, uh, when I was starting college. I got out of college as she was entering college. Now, you mentioned business school, but before we get to that, I wanted to ask you about any summer jobs that you have that may have had something to do with your career plans. Well, um, not not too much. I, I did. I, I always was working. I always had a summer job of some sort. Uh, some of them were pretty menial. I, I parked cars for, for tips. Um, I worked for Tennessee Department of Transportation uh, when they were putting together the I-24 uh, over Missionary Ridge. Um, I worked at the Clerk Summit, my father's law firm, McAllister and McAllister. Um, in college, I had a really interesting job. I worked for AT&T Long Lines out in Nebraska, um, slicing and laying uh, air, uh, civil defense cable all the way across Nebraska. It was a cable that ran from Chicago to Denver. It was all underground. Okay. All right. Now, let's get to UT. You mentioned the business school. Was that at UT as well? Yeah, it was. All right, tell us about college. Well, I, I was very fortunate. My, I was a, uh, uh, my father was Phi Gamma at UT, and so therefore I was a legacy, uh, and that's the attorney I chose. Now, for those uninitiated, uh, Mac, what is a Phi Gamma? Phi Gamma Delta is a, is a fraternity. Okay. They're known, they're known by the nickname Fiji's, um, and so I, I joined Phi Gamma. It was very, again, fortuitous because they really pushed all the young uh, pledges to be active on campus. Uh, and so they pushed me to be an active in a lot of different organizations on campus. The one that they really pushed me for that was really beneficial is they pushed me over to the student newspaper, the Daily Beacon. Um, and I ended up being national advertising manager for the Daily Beacon for three years. That was very helpful because since I worked for the Beacon, I got to register for classes early. Uh, I never had a class before 10 or after 4 or Saturday class. Did any of this have any impact on your decision to go to law school? It did not. I, I, I really had no, my mother, uh, having been around my dad all these years and worked at his law office, uh, tried very hard to discourage me from going to law school because of how much time it took and how hard my father worked at it. Again, six days a week, uh, he was always at the law office. Um, other than football, falls, and then and, and some, some summer, we did boating all the while, summer on Lake Chickamauga. Uh, and so, when I graduated from high school, I was thinking about pre-med, engineering, or business. I uh, heard some really uh, hard stories about how they tried to flunk you out of pre-med and out of engineering. So I said, I'm going to start slowly, start with business school and see where I go. Uh, so I went to college of business at UT. Um, went to three years college of business. I had a real hard time seeing what I was going to do, whatever I had learned in those three years. I just couldn't see. Uh, so I said, well, that you, at that point in time, UT had a three three year program, three three program. Whereas three years after, uh, if you take take the first three years, you're undergraduate, you could enter law school, uh, and uh, in three more years, you could get your undergrad your law degree at law school, and after one year of law school, you could get your undergraduate degree. So it just happened to be the timing, and in fact, that was the last year they were offering it. So I entered uh, law school in. Uh, January of 1968, uh, UT was on quarter system then, and you can and you can enter law school any quarter. And so I entered law school um, and went for the uh, uh, went to the three three program to graduate. Um, uh, so when you does that mean uh, 1971 is when you finished or something? No, I, I I kind of. I kind of did it a little oddly, and it's when you look at my diplomas, people ask me questions about it because I graduated from undergraduate in 1969, December 1969. I graduated from law school in December 1970. 
Uh, so I, there was there's a little thing called a junior English exam at UT required back then that you had to take in order to graduate from undergrad. I just didn't get around to taking that test until finally the military said, you need to graduate because we're going to swear you in once you graduate. Uh, so I went and took the test, passed it, then graduated in December of uh, undergraduate uh, of 69, and I was sworn in as a second lieutenant at that time. Okay. So when, tell us about law school. What what sort of law did you enjoy there? Well, you... interesting. The, the, the most the teacher I enjoyed the most was criminal law, which I had no desire to be a criminal lawyer. Uh, but um, I did really well. I won the moot court, so I thought I was going to be a litigator as a result of that. So I was really uh, focused on being a litigator when I came out of law school at that point. Do you remember who that professor was? I do not. Did you have any favorite professors in law school? I had, again, the, my favorite professor because he taught such an interesting class was the criminal law professor. Right. Um, but um, no, so I, but I went through law school, but it, while I was in law school, I was also working for a full time for the University of Tennessee as director of sports clubs. So I was paying, paying my bills, getting off my parents' payroll because my sister was coming along to college shortly after me. So the last two years of law school, I worked full time, went to law school full time. In fact, I was still working after I graduated uh, from law school while I was studying for the bar exam and while I was taking the bar exam. Okay. Now, you grew up in Chattanooga. You went to school in Knoxville, but somehow you ended up in Nashville. Tell us how that happened. Well, I, I was envious of Nashville. Even, even back in those days, Nashville was a lot more vibrant than Chattanooga. Uh, I've come to really respect Chattanooga more since then, but at the time, I thought it was a little provincial, and I, I wasn't sure whether or not I wanted to uh, go to McAllister, McAllister and be under my dad's thumb, at least when I was learning. I thought I might come back there someday. Um, I went to Knoxville for a year um, after I got back out of the Army, three months in the Army, and uh, uh, went to a litigation law firm in Knoxville and was there for a year. What was the name of that? It was, that was uh, McCampbell, Young, Bartlett, and Wolf. They were a defense litigation, primarily uh, product liability defense. They represent several uh, car companies uh, and defending claims went with that. And I was there for a year and they, they, we made both made a mutual decision that I should go to Nashville. Uh, they wanted a more experienced litigator. I was just one year out of law school at the time. Um, and I wanted to be in Nashville. So I found a, a position with the Tennessee Department of Labor and moved to Nashville. Uh, went to work as a staff attorney for Tennessee Department of Labor. How long did that last? That was a year and a half. And I was hired to be a litigator for the Tennessee Department of Labor. Um, they had just, uh, the state of Tennessee had just put in place the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Um, it was a national one, and there was a Tennessee one. And they had hired me to be a litigator when that act went into effect. Act never went into effect the year and a half I was there. So instead, I ended up being director of two departments with the Department of Labor. I was director of, uh, they had, they just passed, had passed, the state had just passed a new law regulating employment agencies. So I was a director of the section that administered the employment agency law. I had to do, since it was brand new, I had to do everything from develop the forms, develop the processes, uh, applications, the licenses, uh, and administer all that. In addition to that, I also was uh, director uh, over the uh, uh, elevator inspection division. What, uh, what made you decide to leave that? Well, I was always, from day, day one when I got to Nashville, I was looking for a private firm. Um, and so that was just an opportunity to come here and see a lawyers, go to meetings of lawyers, go to the Bar Association, get learn my way around in Nashville and try to find a position that I would like to go forward with in my law practice. How did that work out? Worked out in hindsight. Worked out great. Um, Tell I, us about that. I had the opportunity to join King and Blue. Uh, now, both they thought and I thought that I was going to be a labor lawyer, uh, and so I was under Mr. Blue's wings, and he started me off representing some of the newspapers he he represented. Um, one was in uh, Florida, and one was in South Georgia, and so I did labor negotiations. Um, and flew down and, and visited these newspapers, worked with them, negotiated with labor unions, both of those newspapers for most of a year. But in addition to that, to fill up my plate, I also started, uh, they had they had a lot of collection work. They did a lot of work for First American National Bank. And in fact, they were located at the First American National Bank building. 
some people watching this, Mac, may not be familiar with Frank King and Bob Ballou. So just tell us a little bit about those two men and what you learned about them when you worked there. Well, Frank King was a, was a really fine lawyer. Um, he mostly had a civil practice, uh, a lot of will, stakes, and real property. Um, and um, he had a lot. He also did some loan documentations again for for banks, primarily First American National Bank, which has since changed its name several times through mergers, uh, and, and it is now Regents Bank. Um, Bob Ballou uh, worked for the uh, newspaper publishing company here in Nashville, which was the publisher of both Tennessee and, and the Banner. Tennessee being the morning paper, the Banner being the afternoon paper. Newspaper Printing Corporation. Newspaper Printing Corporation. Um, and he took that uh, after he graduated from law school um, and started a career of representing newspapers on the management side. When you uh, went to work with them ostensibly as a labor lawyer, uh, what actually happened? Well, as I said, uh, I probably worked in labor lawyer for about nine months, but half of my time was filled up with other things other than labor law. Um, Mr. King had a great relationship with First American National Bank, their special assets department, and their finance department. And so uh, I started working with those two departments on their, their accounts, collecting their accounts. Uh, and for long, that work got so heavy uh, I was that I didn't have time for labor law any longer. And so I went full time doing that work. My, my going with King Blue was just, again, very fortuitous in my career. I probably had got more experiences in the five years I was with King Blue than most young lawyers were getting 10 years of a private law firm. Mm -hmm. So day, day one, I had file responsibility. I had direct client contact responsibility. So I did any kind of collection work, enforcement work, defense work on their loans, their loan documents. I did a lot of replevin, uh, writs of possession to pick up cars and mobile homes and other things during those years. Now, some people uh, might not want to answer this question, and you don't have to, but uh, tell us a little bit about the compensation plan that you were under as an associate with King and Blue. I did not have a salary. I, 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 once I completely converted over to solely collection work, I got uh, back in those days, um, every dollar we collected for the bank, the, uh, King and Blue got about one third of that dollar and two thirds were given to the bank. Out of that one third of the dollar that King Blue got, I got a percentage share that was went up as, as the dollars went up each month. So if I collected nothing one month, I would have no compensation. So you learn how to work really hard when you have that over your head and you've got a, a new, mar a new wife and you've got a new home uh, to pay for. And so uh, uh, I got, I had probably more often than I had between 150 and 200 files I was working on every month. And again, those, those were everything from uh, collection files to replevin files to foreclosures uh, that I was working on. So a lot, a lot of experience there. Um, one of the main thing we did for the bike is that we got uh, obtained writs of immediate possession for cars. Um, and you, you've got, it's easy to get the writ of possession, but then you've got to find the car. You've got to find the car and have the sheriff show up at the same time where the car is with the writ in hand. So we actually went out, I actually went out and did that personally. The lawyers did that? The lawyers did it. Went out personally. And some at night in some areas of Nashville I would not go into now. Um, <laughs> did you have any interesting experiences during that period? Well, uh, I did some interesting uh, replevins. Uh, you know, as long as you didn't breach the peace, you didn't have to have a sheriff there to pick up the car. If you could, if the car was sitting on the side of the road or in a public parking lot, you could just go call a record and the record hook it up and pull it off. But if there's any chance that there's going to be a breach of the peace or you're going to have to move a car or you had to open the garage door to get to the car or a car was blocked in by another car or something, that's when we called the sheriff who came uh, with his warrant and served the warrant. Um, and then the record came and uh, hooked it up and towed it off. Um, so most of those, and some, you know, one I had, I, I do remember uh, several times of uh, 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 serving a car and seizing a car in a parking lot uh, outside of, of an individual's work. Uh, one on um, Christmas Eve um, that uh, uh, rainy, nasty day, kind of like today is, uh, much colder than today, though, and uh, I 
found the car, got the uh, sheriff, to come, deputy sheriff to come join me. He brought the warrant. We hooked the uh, rector up to it and towed it off. So I threw that person from him surprised when they walked out and there was no car there that afternoon. One, one of my uh, uh, partners, I guess we're partners, we're all just uh, young lawyers that work with me. We, we represented Goodyear Tire. Back in those days, Goodyear Tire had a lot of locations around town. Uh, and they sold appliances. Uh, and so he he uh, issued writs of possession for some of the appliances that the debtors had not paid for. Um, and the story I always love is that uh, he found uh, one, uh, he served a warrant on one person on the day before Thanksgiving. Uh, he was, and the writ was to pick up the stove. Um, and they, they, they served it and the stove had a turkey cooking in it. And they set the, the turkey out to the side, took the stove, um, and they uh, were successful in circuit rid of possession. You had a rid of possession of the stove, but not for the turkey. Not for the turkey. So, so you had to have the turkey. And be careful to separate them. That's right. You always had to be really careful when you were rid of possession. You had to be sure what you were getting and that you weren't getting more than you should get when you served a rid of possession. So, um, Yes, we could, you could serve it on more than what your possession allowed you to say to take. Now, doing this collection work, Mac, you at times were representing, in effect, the bank. Is that your first time to represent a bank? That was. That was. Well, a lot of experience, again, like I said, I had first chair experience. I had direct contact with the bank, direct file responsibility. It was, all my files were solely my responsibility from the first day I started working at King of Blue till five years later and I left. So I got a lot of good relationships with bank officers uh, at First American. Um, and some of those bank officers that I had a relationship with then moved to other banks later. And I had a relationship with them and I had worked with them later on in my practice. Uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, Mr. Blue knew the current bankruptcy judge really well, uh, Paul Jennings. Uh, and I asked him to approach Paul Jennings and Paul, uh, started appointing me as uh, Chapter 7 trustee. Um, uh, that time, we were under the Bankruptcy Act. Um, so he was appointing me as Chapter 7 trustee. So I started bankruptcy work. What's, what's funny about the bankruptcy work is that when I was with Campbell Young, Barley, and Wolf, they sent me one day over to bankruptcy court. Now, you got to remember, in law school back in those days, we didn't have a uh, bankruptcy class. We didn't have a bankruptcy course. We didn't have a credit rights course. We didn't, we didn't have any of that. So the first time I ever saw a bankruptcy court, I walked into it when I was practicing it here in Knoxville. I didn't have a clue what was going on. Their terminology, their what they, they how they handled the court, what they were doing made no sense to me at all. I had not ever heard of it, been around it. I came back to court and said, I never, ever want to go to bankruptcy court again. Then when I got to King and Blue, when I started serving as a chapter trustee, uh, that started a career as a bankruptcy lawyer that I worked through for 20 years. Now, for those of us that are not familiar with Chapter 7, Chapter 11, and all these other chapters, tell us a little bit about what you did as a trustee. Well, the best, best way is to compare what, so in, in 1978, the new bankruptcy code was passed, and it went in effect in 1979. Uh, and that code appointed a panel of trustees, seven people here in the Middle District are a panel of trustees. And they were going to be appointed to serve as trustee in all Chapter 7 cases, just Chapter 7. They could be appointed in Chapter 11 also, but Chapter 7 is a liquidation bankruptcy where you you go to court, you fill out a petition and schedules under penalties of perjury. Uh, and um, practically trustee's duty is to look at your petition and schedules, determine if they're accurate. Uh, they're all, if they're accurate, uh, to, to look and see if there's any assets for benefit for creditors. If there are, convert those assets to cash and distribute them to creditors. So as Chapter 7 trustee, then for 17 years, I was on the panel of trustees, and I would have, um, I'd have two or three dockets uh, every two weeks of about 15 to 20 cases each. I got paid $30 per case. If, if, if it was a no-asset case, I got paid $30 a case. Had to be really efficient to make that worthwhile. Uh, if it was an asset case, if I found some asset there that needed to be liquidated and distributed to the creditors of the debtor, then I got paid on a sliding scale of how much I recovered for the estate. So I was always in, uh, all this go goes into my representation of banks, not only then, but later, because the biggest challenge to a bank and its security interest is the powers of a Chapter 7 trustee. Chapter 7 trustee can, 
if they find defects in your security interest, they can set aside your security interest, which means that collateral is no longer secured to a bank, and the trustee can liquidate that collateral and distribute the assets. Um, so that's where I also learned how to challenge a, a trustee to a bank's uh, collateral. Okay. Now we, we've gotten into your bankruptcy practice, but we haven't talked about who you're practicing law with. Where'd you go after King and Blue? Well, I, of course, I was with King and Blue for five years, and I, st I did other things while I was King and Blue, too. Uh, Frank King had a real estate practice where he did uh, title searches and issuing of title, pen, uh, title commitments to the, the various title companies in town. And unlike what they have now, where you go punch a computer and put it in and they search the title for we had to physically go over to uh, the Register Deeds Office and look at the grantor grantee book. Felix Wilson? Wilson? Felix Wilson. And go over to the grantor grantee book and, and go back 30 years uh, and then come back forward 30 years. Then we had to go look at the deed of trust book and look through it for 30 years and come forward. Then we had to go to the lien book and search for it for 30 years. And that that would get your title. Then you would take you would take that search. Well, that's tracked index. Right. You had to go through all the indexes. That's right. <laughs> And then, then you would go over, take that over to the title company and certify it to the title company. And the title company would then issue a commitment for either uh, an owner's title policy or a loan title policy, depending on what it was doing. Mr. King was also doing some bank loan documentation. So I started doing bank loan documentation about that time, um, which again, helped me later on. Um, well, you mentioned that in your work as trustee, Sometimes you would find defects with these uh, deeds of trust and so on. And if you were able to do that, that, that meant the money went into the estate. Uh, did your work with King and Ballou and later real estate help you with your trustee work? Oh, yeah, because I'd already been around loan documents and documentation. I knew what to look for and, and where they could mess up. You know, they, they didn't perfect their security interest. Uh, if they let the UCC financing statement lapse, if they... Uh, we had somebody that, that, that filed a, a deed of trust in the wrong county. Um, the street address of the property was Brentwood. So everybody immediately thought that Brentwood's got to be Williamson County. Well, part of Brentwood for a post office box purposes is actually Davidson County. So they had filed their deed of trust in the wrong county, which meant they were unsecured. So I had the property to uh, uh, to deal with. So, yeah, I, I, was, I was always looking for defects in the uh, secured creditors liens, that was the most likely source. There's sometimes they file chapter seven and they would have assets. And they said, I'm just through with this. I want to walk away from my debts. Thing you get out of chapter seven is you list all your assets, you list all your liabilities. As long as you haven't uh, done anything improper leading up to that, then you're entitled to a discharge. And that's a personal discharge of your, li of your liabilities. Um, and some people just wanted to walk away and, and they, they brought assets into the bankruptcy case. Uh, let, rather, rather them deal with it, they rather me deal with it, and so I would deal with it. But more often than not, I was finding defects in the secured creditors, uh, security interest, setting aside those security interests, and then selling whatever assets could be real property, be a car, boat, uh, or whatever I would find. All right, does that bring us uh, to the end of King and Blue and on to the next firm? It does. Um, where was that? That was, uh, Day after Labor Day, 1978. Uh, next two people that had a really uh, important role in my life and really responsible where we where I ended up and where I've been all these years, Frank Woods uh, and Charles Bone. Uh, Charles Bone and I both went to UT Law School together. We all we both started that off quarter. We both graduated in December of uh, 1970. We weren't close. I had a group I ran around with mostly that I knew from undergraduate school. Uh, he went to undergraduate at Vanderbilt, but we you know we knew each other, we saw each other, and then after he graduated and uh, he came back to Square in Gallatin to practice law, Frank Woods, when Charles was at Vanderbilt, was a dorm counselor or dorm supervisor, whatever that's called, on the floor of Charles, and they made they were close friends, and they got involved in politics together, uh, so they were close friends. So Frank had uh, acquired United American Bank in Nashville. Uh, it was located in what we now call Noel Hotel, Noel Place now. Um, and Frank wanted his own law firm to represent the bank. So he contacted Charles uh, about coming to Nashville from his Gallatin law firm, a uh, good all in bone at Gallatin, uh, and opening up an office here in Nashville. Uh, Frank's wife was the commissioner of revenue. 
Jane Ann. Jane Wood. She graduated law school also. Her uh, her general counsel for Parker Ridley was Mike North. So the, the parts fit all because of Frank. All the parts fit together. Uh, we started a law firm the day after Labor Day in 1978. Uh, it was called Bone and Woods. It was Charles Bone, Jane Ann Woods, myself, and Charles Bone. Um, Frank uh, knew uh, a young lady uh, that had just had been working for Clifford Allen, who had just died and and, um, and needed a job, looking for a job. And he asked her to come uh, and be work with our law firm. Uh, she's now my wife. Uh, so he put put all of that together. And who is that? That's that's Renee. Uh, Renee Gentry then is Renee McAllister now. Okay. But we worked together for a long time, and then we've, we've been married a long time now. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, well, this is a good Frank time. Wood has kind of pulled, pulled everybody together at the same time, same place. I want to get more about Frank Woods, but I've overlooked the rest of your family. So tell us about you know, children and grandchildren while we're on your yeah. wife, Renee. Well, Renee, this is Renee's and I's second marriage. She has two children. I have two children. Um, they're all four married. Uh, we have a total of nine grandchildren uh, from age five years old. My youngest is five. Will be He'll be six next month. Uh, we've got two there, 27. So we've, we've got four out of college. Uh, one's a junior in high school. Uh, another one is a sophomore in high school. Um, we've got two, uh, another in, um, I guess what we call middle school, I guess you would call it. Right. Um, uh, one in, uh, uh, in elementary school and then one in kindergarten. Well, wow. I think, I, I think that was all of them. My, my two children, my daughter adopted three children. So she's got three adopted children. Uh, my son adopted his son. So he's, he's got one, one son uh, is adopted. So um, got four adopted children and Renee's family. Uh, they all, they all came very quick. The first four children uh, came within uh, about three and a half year period of time, from two different families. Uh, and she, uh, she was working for me at the time uh, as a paralegal. And she quit or retired or something. Anyhow, she walked out the door, uh, went home, and she took care of the grandchildren while their parents worked uh, until they started uh, elementary school. Okay. Now, I do want to know about Frank Woods because Frank Woods uh, is a big name in Nashville, and and uh, he uh, had some other business interests before the law firm that you discussed. Uh, do you remember what all he did before and after uh, Frank? Start uh, form Woods and Bone, Bone and Woods. Bone and Woods. Well, of course, he he wasn't the Woods and Bone. That was Jane Ann. That was Jane Ann. A lot of people hey, don't realize that. That's good Jane Ann. Jane Ann. Well, main thing I knew of him, I didn't know much. I didn't know him before we started together. But uh, is that he he was the president and prior uh, majority owner of United American Bank of Nashville, which is different from the other United American banks that were in East Tennessee um, that were were owned by Jake Butcher. Um, though there was a relationship there, but uh, Jake was not an owner of United American Bank of Nashville. Okay. CH has small interest in United American Bank of Nashville, as I understand it. Okay. Uh, Frank was, had a company, I think it was some kind of a radio broadcasting. Well, Frank, Frank was always some, involved in radio broadcasting, and, and uh, uh, he, he sold and, and purchased radio stations. I, I did work with him on that. Mike Norton worked with him. On those radio stations, okay. uh, that's kind of Mike's thing, and uh, yeah, he bought and sold radio stations. But the the partnership that really endured, even to this day, was with uh, Charles W. Bone. That's right. So tell us about him. Well, Charles uh, grew up in Galton, Tennessee, on on the Bone family farm. Uh, Charles' dad was uh, president of the Bank of Gillespie. Um, and he decided he didn't want to be a farmer the rest of his life uh, and went to Vanderbilt undergraduate. His, his father wanted him to go to Vanderbilt, wanted to have somebody in his family graduate from Vanderbilt. So he went to Vanderbilt undergraduate and then transferred to UT at law school. Um, but he, had, he, no, he didn't have any members of his family that had been lawyers before. Uh, but uh, then he, so as soon as he graduated from law school, though, he went back to Gallatin and opened a law office on the square of Goodall and Bone. And you mentioned Goodall. Who was the Goodall? I can't tell you. <laughs> it's been so long now. But Bob? Man, I think it's Bob Goodall, yeah. yeah. Later became a judge, I think. I think that's right. Yeah. Okay. But you didn't really know him then. You met him when 
Bone and Woods formed. Well, I, I knew Charles from law school. Okay. But barely. I mean, we speak to each other. Right. We were in the same place. The first, back in those days, a lot of the things that UT did back in those days is that they would let people like me in school and they'd see how long you could study. Um, and they did that in particularly pre-med engineering, which are two things that scared me off of pre-med and engineering. But they did like law school too. So the, the off quarter that uh, Charles and I started, uh, we went into the large moot courtroom with all the seating in there. And I think there was 48 of us that started the uh, the same quarter there in January of 1968. Um, and they said, look at the person on your left, look at the person on your right. Two of the three of you will not be here in three years. Good luck. Um, and it, they were true. There was, there, was about, uh, there was about 12 of us that graduated on time mm -hmm. out of the 48. Now, eventually, I think, I, had, I don't know the exact count, but I think something closer, maybe slightly less than 20 graduated. But it, it, they definitely did uh, uh, turn over the students. And if you, if you didn't make it, they didn't, they didn't worry about you. Now, I think I've heard you refer to your years at King and Ballou as your boot camp in the law. What was it like to be in the, the Bowman Woods firm? Completely different. <laughs> Tell us about that. Well, we, uh, we were we were all partners from day one. Um, uh, Charles, uh, myself, Mike Norton, and Jane Ann Woods. Jane Ann didn't do a lot of practice. She she knew a lot of people and did a lot of meetings and things like that. Um, Charles has always been the business developer, the business getter. Uh, um, he's always has. Is, is that what we call a rainmaker? A rainmaker, exactly. He, he he was a rainmaker. He never found a legal problem that he wouldn't tell somebody we can handle that. Um, and so from 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 day one, um, he he brought in a lot of business. In fact, the day the first day we started, the day after Labor Day, I had a full eight hours of billable time that day, doing work for United American Bank. And it never ceased after that was we had a great relation. We we're in the same building. They were downstairs. We were upstairs. If they needed us, they could come upstairs. If we we needed them, we go downstairs. We didn't have to even use the phone. Um, and we were friends with them. We, we uh, um, they, the United American Bank had a lot of great summer parties, had a great Christmas party. And the law firm was just part of the family to do all that. Um, Mike Norton because uh, he helped rewrite a lot of Tennessee tax uh, statutes when he was at the Department of Revenue. Uh, so he did a lot of tax work. We also did a lot of mergers and acquisitions work. Um, Charles, Charles Bone, the other thing he did is that he represented a lot of banks. He did a lot of one bank holding companies. He probably did more one bank holding companies than any other lawyer in Tennessee. Uh, he was counsel for uh, Independent Bankers Association, which were all the small banks versus all the, the big banks, the First American National Banks, the Commerce Union Banks, and the Third National Banks that were located in the state at the time. Uh, so he had a lot of relationships with smaller banks. So we did a lot of work for smaller banks because of Charles' relationship. Now this may seem like an unusual question, Mac, but did your work at the United American Bank ever involve frogs? I pursued a lot of fraud cases. I investigated a lot of fraud cases. Uh, Yes, I am in not fraud. We'll get to oh, frogs. Okay, frogs. F R O G S. Yes, United American Bank sponsored. Uh, I'm trying to remember exactly what the name of it was, but it was some kind of frog um, uh, contest or something. And they actually had frogs, and they actually had jumping frogs. And uh, it was a lot of. It was a fun day. Yeah. Uh, if, I recall, you, if I recall correctly, Mr. Yarbrough, you were there. You officiated. This is the only reason I know. Right. right. See so you. Your bad luck is that you got me to do this, and I know about this. Didn't you officiate the frog jumping contest? I think I helped with it, at least. I'm not sure I'll officiate it, but I, I helped with help one of the bike officers with that. Yes. I see. All right. Now it, it was it was just it was a great opportunity for a party. <laughs> That's what brought it to mind. Now, on a more serious note, you mentioned the other word, fraud, F-R-A-U-D. Uh, what what did you want to say about that? Well, what Charles, so Jane Ann, uh, in my representation of, of banks, so banks have always been the base of our law firm uh, ever since 1978, all the way through current time, bank representation. Um, so as part of that representation, we've done everything you can do to a bank. We have bought it, sold it, merged it, um, 
one bank holding company did um watched it close under our watch uh, one bank uh closed under our watch and but and while we we're doing that we did everything the bank needed to do and sometimes we were investigating fraud from some borrowers from the bank from some bank officers got involved with some uh, bank officers uh, they committed fraud on the bank uh, filed claims under their fidelity bond um, so had a lot of that at different times during our representation of banks. What was your favorite part of working at Bowling Woods? Well, my favorite part, of course, was I really loved the people I was working with, the Charles and Mike. Um, you had a receptionist uh, that has remained a friend. Even we have state. a receptionist, Melville Miller, who we, we hired. The, the day one, we had more work than we could handle. The day after Labor Day. That's a lovable quality of it. Is, it is very good. And uh, uh, the, the fun, I'll give you a story about Charles and I and the use of the dictaphone. Uh, it goes back. I don't know if you've heard that story or not, but. Um, well, I need to hear it. Go ahead. Well, again, everything, everything goes together. Everything fitted together. My wife, Renee, knew Melba Metter. Melba was working part time at a church. Uh, Renee was one of, we had four lawyers and two assistants, and the assistants couldn't keep up with us. We had so much work. So they needed a receptionist to take some of the burden off the secretaries. So we hired Melva to come in for two days a week. And then, again, the, we were growing so fast, adding so much work at the time, uh, that Charles gave Melva an ultimatum. You've either got to come work with us full time or I'm going to have to go find somebody else. So she came to work with us full time. So she was our, our receptionist, great creator, knew everybody, knows everybody um, as part of our team. Um, and so, um, but again, we were growing so fast. The Charles and I, back in those days, um, we, we were just getting uh, mag card typewriters. Uh, we were just getting past using onion skin for filling out fleetings, which probably most people won't know what that is, but uh, for filling out fleetings. Carbon paper. Very thin paper with carbon between each sheet. Um, What's the most you ever saw or did? Well, I don't know, five or six, as far as you can go. You had, so you had one heavy sheet on top, which is original. Then you could get four or five, maybe, uh, uh, unskinned papers with, with uh, carbon between each. If you made one typo, you had to go through each page and, and correct each one. And that's the way you filed pleadings back then. You didn't have, you didn't have, a, you didn't have a, a Xerox machine that you can copy. But uh, so when we first started, we had we had dictaphone set up, and uh, the dictaphone we had a phone on our desk that we pick up and we could dictate in it. Um, Charles and I shared. Uh, Renee was uh, our secretary, um, and we so she had one big uh, tank up under her desk that whether I dictated or Charles dictated, uh, all that dictation would go to the tank on her desk, and she would take it off and transcribe it as she got to it, or it was put on in the tank. Well, we quickly learned that, Charles quickly learned, that when I was dictating, he couldn't get on the dictaphone, which I dictate all the time. And when the dict tank was full, he couldn't get on the dictaphone either. So at that point in time, he had already hired a young lady called Vicki Scruggs uh, in his Galson office. He brought her down from Galson, and she joined us. Uh, at, at, what did she do? Well, at that point in time, she was a secretary also. As the years have gone by, she graduated from that to a paralegal, to office manager, to um, she she is uh, she has been at the current law firm we've been with. She's been the office coordinator and manager uh, for years, but she's with us too. So she's part of the team that has gone all the way back to 1978. Right. Okay. Uh, did we did we finish the dictaphone story? No. Uh, and Charles Charles had to have his own system with his own dictaphone for that from thereafter. <laughs> And I still, as you know, I still dictate. I still dictate my pleadings. I actually think better with a dictaphone in my hand than I do otherwise, I think. But, uh, I, I think a lot of older lawyers are, would agree with you. Now, uh, how long did Bone and Woods last as a law firm? Bone and Woods lasted. We, we changed names and add some names to it from time to time, but Bone and Woods, like really Bone and Woods itself, Jane Ann, with Jane Ann Woods, lasted for five years. It lasted until 1983, so 1978 to 1983. Um, it coincided with the closing of United American Bank National by FDIC um, on 
uh, Memorial Day weekend, uh, 1983. Always on a holiday. It, it is. Things that way. Now, is there anything you want to say about the closing of the, the bank and the Butcher Brothers, or is that uh, really not part of your story? It's really not part of my story. Um, the, the, the Butcher Brothers, uh, Jake Butcher, who ran for uh, Democratic governor twice, I think, um, and his, his brother, C.H. Butcher, uh, set up a banking empire up in, in Knoxville. Uh, Jake Butcher operated out of uh, United American Bank, Knoxville, and he had several United American banks in different counties that, that he owned control. Uh, C.H. Butcher had C&C &C Bank, which I think stand, stood for City and County Bank. Again, in small towns and around, uh, around East Tennessee. Jake Butcher was responsible for bringing the World's Fair to Knoxville uh, in 1982. Um, and then shortly after the World's Fair closed, uh, federal regulators descended upon his all his banks and all C.H. Uh, Butcher's banks to do a, a really in-depth audit because they, they were afraid things were being moved from bank to bank. So they did them all at the same time. There's no place to move. So they all came in and the result of that is uh, what the bikers referred to as a Valentine's Day massacre. On Valentine's Day of oh, 1983, okay. they closed all Jake Butcher's and C.H. Butcher's bikes. Okay. That's so, uh, that's like all the balls hitting the table at once. That's right. That's right. Or the music stops and we find out who doesn't have a chair. The, 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 or the pool, the water drains out of the pool and we find out who's swimming Naked. Have I used all the cliches that you would? No, use? Those are those are excellent cliches. Yes. Okay. Um, tell us what what happened after that. So, well, I really didn't have any relationship to either one of those banks. I didn't have any representation of those banks. I did have opportunities. That I had, had worked with those banks or worked with their counsel or offices on different loans and things, but it wasn't a direct relation. Uh, the bank here in Nashville had a similar name, uh, but Frank Woods was the president and owned the, most of the bank. Um, and so it wasn't, it wasn't directly pulled down because they closed. The, the two Butcher brothers both pled guilty to bank fraud. Uh, they both were sentenced to 20 years. I think they served six on good behavior. Uh, I think they're both deceased now. Um, but the allegations are that they used loans from those banks to fund their own very high lifestyle. That they both to, uh, had nice yachts. Um, Jake helped fund the... Uh, uh, World's Fair with some money he borrowed from his bank. Uh, he helped, he, he used the banks to fund his buying of other banks. So it was all kind of put together. So when it all came down on, on Valentine's Day, uh, that was the end of that. And uh, there was another banker that ran for governor in, in uh, 74 named Franklin Haney. Had you ever done any business with I've him? I've done any business with Franklin Haney. I knew about him, but I had not ever done any business with Franklin Haney. The famous uh, election or primary of 1974, uh, Tom Wiseman used to brag, he later became a federal judge, but he used to brag that uh, he came in first in that election among non-fellows <laughs> <laughs> because Governor Blanton, Mr. Haney, and Jake Butcher They're all went to federal prison. That's right. I remember that. Yeah. All right. So um, that's the end of uh, Bone and Woods. What next? Well, it wasn't quite the end of Bowling Woods. It was in end of it in name only. Okay. So when when the bank, when the United American Bank was closed, the FDIC took back all of our files. And uh, you know, at that time we were real nervous. What's this gonna do to our business? Is this gonna put us out of business? What we found out is that we had so many other clients that we had generated over the years at other banks, not related, didn't have anything to do with the closure of United American Bank. Uh, that uh, we hired, we hired one lawyer to deal solely with collection matters for United American Bank, and one assistant uh, for that lawyer. And those are the only ones that we had more than what we needed because we because all that work went away. So we just lost two people, and we just kept on going. But we we changed our firm's name, so uh, we used to joke about it. It's Bone and Current Friends uh, from that point on. We moved out from there. We moved out to uh, um, uh, um, Vanderbilt Plaza. Um, and we were there for five years, and we had we're doing things in five-year increments. Here. It, it kind of seemed that way. Uh, the one consistent with everything from 1978 to the current day is that the group of us—Charles, myself, Mike Norton—until he passed, uh, Vicky Scruggs, 
Um, we all, whenever we move, we all move together. Okay. And there's a, we have a number of moves. We, we have mergers, moves, change of names. So in that time, we were at Vanderbilt Plaza. We had several different names of people we brought in as partners. Uh, for a short period of time, one one was, and I don't even think uh, he was partner long enough for us to print any letterhead for him. Uh, I think it lasted less than a week or so. But uh, we grew this law firm from four lawyers. Uh, we were in the 16 to 18 lawyer range at that point in time mm -hmm. and staff. Um, and what was the name? Which, well, we had a lot of different names. That's right. I, it was both, the only consistency was the first name was always Bone. Um, and then uh, in 1983, uh, Baker Worthington, Crosley, Stansbury, and Wolf, a Knoxville law firm, approached us. They had a Nashville office. That's Howard Baker. And Howard Baker's law firm. Um, and Bob Williams and Howard Baker uh, and wanted us to join and merge with them. And we, we joined them in 1983. How'd that work out? Worked out great. Again, it's about a five-year time period there. Um, in the same office or a different location? No, we uh, at that point in time, the building we're now in, National City Center, uh, it opened in 1980. So that was 1988. Um, it opened in 1988. And... Um, we we moved. There was uh, Baker Rogan had some attorneys that were based in what's called a life and casualty tower at that time, and so we all moved together to new offices um, in National City Center in 1988. 16th floor, 16th and 17th floor, correct. Okay. We had a stairway between the two floors. But the build out was done by Baker and Worthington. Right. Okay. It was. It was Bob Worthington's design. We had large hallways and pretty large uh, attorney offices, uh, things that you can't do nowadays with the, with the rent you have nowadays. But it was, looked really nice back then. And so we were there for a number of years. very nice. I yeah. agree with that. We, we were there for, again, till I think my time here. So that's 1988. We're there to 1993, approximately. Um, when we, yeah, we, when we left, uh, Baker Worthington. Again, the group proud to get her, plus a lot of other lawyers with us. Uh, and we moved to White Terry Combs, a Louisville based law firm. So Baker Worthington had 125 lawyers when we merged with them in 1988. White Tarrant uh, had 225 lawyers when we merged with them in 1993. Lawyers in Kentucky, Tennessee, and I think Indiana. Where was that located? We 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 stayed in the uh, we we moved down one floor, fifteen down to fifteen, and then we started to build out a, a new offices out at twenty five twenty five West End right at the I guess that would be the northern end of Vanderbilt Stadium okay right where the Marriott Hotel is there uh, Vanderbilt Marriott and uh, we were out there for until uh, until two thousand and one. Right. What happened in 2001? 2001. Well, one interesting thing about both the move from uh, Baker Worthen and the move from Wyatt is that Charles had gotten irritated with the structure and the decision making process in both firms, of which the home office was not in Nashville. Um, Absentee landlord. Absentee landlord. And he, he had been the managing partner for both national office for both firms. And he resigned as managing partner from both. And guess who ended up being managing partner for both for the last year, for the last year uh, before we, we left. That each would time. be you. That would be me. And so. Um, did you like that? I didn't mind it. I'd rather him be the managing partner, but uh, I'd rather I'd rather work than be in management. Okay. But I was the most likely person to do it. So I, I was willing to do that. So um, he had a falling out with the, the firm. Uh, and. Uh, in uh, 2001, I believe it was the fall of 2001, and he he left with Wyatt Terry. Well, what became of your little group? And well, we stayed working for Wyatt Terry. In 2002, he started a new law firm, uh, uh, which was just uh, the Bone Firm, is what it was initially called. And gradually, in 2002, uh, some of the partners started trickling out of Wyatt. Uh, and the firm became known as Bone Callister Norton. Who were some of those people that slipped out? Believe it or not, of course, uh, Mike Norton, uh, myself, uh, Jack Stringham, 
Trace Blankenship, Paz Haynes, um, you know, most, you know, a lot of these people. They, All people that are with you today. With us today. That's right. Yes. And so we, we they, they graduated trickled. I, I, I left why, if I recall, May 15 of 2002. Uh, Mike was already out. Charles was already out at that point. So we, we named the firm Bone McAllister Norton Peel. Where did you set up shop? At, at that, at that, we had temporary offices at twenty five twenty five, uh, and then we 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 uh, had a deal. We were going to move into what I call, still call, the the uh, the new third national bank building, new third national annex there, uh, where Fifth Third is now. Uh, and so we moved there temporarily while we were working on plans for a build out of new offices in that building, um, and we worked on those plans for nine months, um, and. We, we had negotiated the plans, we had negotiated the lease, we were ready to sign the lease, and we weren't happy with it. Um, so I, walk, I walked over to National City Center and said, by chance, do you have any office space left? And they said, yes, by chance we do. In fact, we have the Baker Worthington space left because they had moved out by that time. They had moved to uh, what I call Chamber of Commerce building down on uh, Commerce Street uh, and said, we can sublease this to you. So this we was had, the area that you like, the wide halls and the very right, the, 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 those those things, right? And so it the uh, the building manager and I came to a very quick agreement on a lease uh, assumption of lease, um, and we moved in less than a month to National City Center, there you go. and we've been in National City Center since then, um, if our, in our, our various capacities. Now, of course, now. We've, we've merged in. That's another story. We've merged into a, right. another firm. Um, but um, we're, we're us and Waller and the bank are the longest lasting tenants in National City Center. We, Waller and us and the bank moved in when it was first opened in 1988, our law firm back then, which was, well, of course, it was Baker Worthington then. But and of course, Waller has become Holland and Knight. Holland and Knight now. So lots of changes, but. That's right. The personnel didn't change that much. I've, I've, I've learned to find my way to the building every morning. <laughs> Which, by the way, when do you normally do that? Well, uh, when I was in college, I was not an early riser. In fact, I, I tried to do everything I could not have to get up before 10 o'clock in the morning when I was in college. When I started law work, I found I needed to be at work by between 8 and 8.30 to, to please the attorney I was working with. Uh, when my children came along, um, I need to be, I wasn't seeing them either way. If I got there at eight, I wasn't seeing them in the morning. And I was working late till six or seven at night. I wasn't seeing them at night before I went to bed. So I, I changed my work habits to go early in the morning. And as that has morphed over all these years, um, I usually get the office somewhere between five and 6 a.m. And I usually leave somewhere around 6 p.m. most nights. Uh, it's just work I've gotten used to. Good news about coming in at 5 a.m., Traffic lights in downtown Nashville are blinking yellow. They don't start blinking red and green until 6 a.m. So I always like to beat that. It makes my commute a whole lot easier. Because there's no traffic on the road. When when somebody comes in later in the day, it's oh, it was terrible traffic. I said, what traffic? I didn't see traffic this morning. But and you you also uh, were the, the snow uh, reporter. I was a snow reporter. I was I made it to the office every snow or ice day, and I report on whether or not anybody else should come or not. A lot of days I made a decision we closed the office, but uh, there's a few times I couldn't get home. I got the office, but couldn't get home. Uh, Very good. Very good. Well, we talked a lot about these firms, and we may go back to it a little bit, but I want I don't want to leave out some things that I know about you that uh, you you may or may not want to talk about, but who is Tupper Saucy? Tupper Saucy. In my collection work, I met some really interesting people, of course. Uh, the good news, I was on the right side of all collection work because Tennessee is a great uh, state to be a lender in because that's what I call it's a contract state. If you can get the, the, your details of your loan in writing, which is the contract, then it's usually enforceable. Of course, we usually enforce it. So uh, Tupper Saucy was one of the debtors that defaulted on his loan to uh, United American Bank. So I filed a simple lawsuit to collect, and it, because of the size of the debt, uh, it was greater than uh, General Sessions' jurisdiction, so it I filed a lawsuit in Chancery Court. Do you remember how big it was? I don't. I don't. Did, did you know anything about this person? I, not not until then. He, uh, I found out a lot about him afterwards. 
Um, you know, that, that was one of the real benefits of, of my work at, uh, at King & Blue is that uh, on any given week, I had at least one docket of 10 to 20 cases in General Sessions Court, sometimes two dockets of 10 or 20 cases. So I was in General Sessions Court every week during the five years I was with King & Blue. I also had cases in Chancery Court. I was in Chancery Court at least several times a month. A uh, whole five years I was King Blue. I took several cases to the Court of Appeals. Um, and so I had a lot of experience in that, especially trying to enforce the notes or enforce guarantees. I, I litigated Court of Guarantees to the Court of Appeals several times. Um, so I got that's one of those things I learned, had an opportunity to learn in my boot camp uh, at King Blue. Uh, and I, in addition to having first file responsibility and direct contact with the client, uh, helped me progress my whole career and my knowledge of practice of law along where I was able to in 1978 to step out and take off with uh, our new law firm. Uh, what about Tupper Saucy? What did you find T out? Tupper Saucy, I filed a simple collection lawsuit asking for a judgment. Well, I found out Tupper, Tupper, I knew a little bit about him. I learned quickly. He he, he was an author. Um, he was also a musician. He was a tax activist. He did not like the IRS. He didn't want to pay the IRS. He didn't believe in filing tax returns or paying any of the IRS, and he didn't. Um, but the most thing he was, he, he was a, um, uh, he, he believed that the Vatican controlled the United States. Uh, he was a, a conspiracy theorist. Um, and he also believed that only the legal tender uh, is gold. So his, he came in, uh, filed his answer, um, and he said, I don't owe anything because the only legal tender in the United States is gold. It says so in the Constitution. Um, and therefore, they didn't give me any gold. Therefore, I don't have to pay anything back. And Did that work out for him? Well, it caused me a lot of research because he, he filed some really advanced briefs. So this, this group of tax activists clearly worked together, and they, they already had their briefs prepared and all cite all kinds of Federalist papers, uh, uh, writings of the drafters of the Constitution, and all this backup. And he filed all this with court. Of course, as you and I know, Judge Chancellor is going back a bit over backwards for a pro se defendant. And so the Chancellor was doing such. And so I had to go research all this and, and uh, counter all his arguments and come in and ask for summary judgment, and which I got, but not without a lot of work to get there. And, and then, he, then he, he became somewhat famous over time. He, he did. So he, he, he was finally convicted of tax evasion. Uh, but he, he didn't file tax returns. He didn't file, he didn't pay his taxes. Uh, so he was convicted, um, and uh, he was ordered to, to report to prison, and he did just that. Uh, he was ordered to report on a certain date. Let's say so today is the, uh, uh, what, the 21st of November. November. Say so he was ordered to report November 21. He went to prison, said, I, I report. Nobody was there to accept his reporting. He, comp he complied with the order of the court as far as he was concerned. He left. Uh, and so he he was he he uh, avoided uh, arrest from that point on. He went down and lived uh, in, around Suwannee uh, and kind of been a kind of a hermit down around Suwannee after that. My collection, I got my judgment. I did collect a few uh, assets from him while he was in Suwannee, but not much. You know, the, the easiest thing about collection work is getting the judgment. The hardest thing is collecting the judgment. Sure. And one thing I learned, in, again, my boot camp at King Blue is how to collect the judgment. Because if I didn't collect the judgment, I didn't get paid. If I didn't get paid, I didn't pay my mortgage. Um, and so highly motivated. I've highly motivated to collect. And I've learned how to, to operate. You know, one thing you don't necessarily get in, in most law firms, or you don't, you don't get to law school, is, okay, now you have a judgment. What do you do with it? Uh, and I learned how to do it, and I was pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. And Hollins used to say you could pay for your bathroom wall with them. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you had another famous uh, fellow that you encountered named Pug Vickers. Who was Pug Vickers? Pug Vickers. Uh, Pug Vickers lived in Huntington, Tennessee, Carroll County. Uh, and he owned, his, his fame was that he had what I think was the world's largest Harley Davidson dealership in downtown Huntington. I'm not sure they had a street light or not, but anyhow, downtown Huntington. People would fly in from all over the country and come buy their Harley Davidson motorcycle and drive off with it. Um, and so he had a huge business. He also owned the bike down there, um, Carroll County Bike. Um, and 
he was majority shareholder and United American Bank had the loan secured by his stock uh, in Carroll County Bank. So he default, he, he, they, he had some financial difficulties. Uh, he defaulted on his, uh, on his uh, leadership, Harley Davidson leadership, and it went out of business. Uh, he defaulted on the bank loan, um, and the bank wanted to um, declare default and uh, sell the stock, acquire the stock. All, at the same time, though, Carroll County Bank was having financial difficulties also. Surprising, surprising. And the commissioner, uh, uh, state commissioner, uh, uh, financial institution was ready to close it down because they didn't have enough capital. And United American Bank was willing to put money in if he could collect on its stock. It'd be the stockholder to put money in to keep the bank afloat. Well, Pug Vickers blocked that by filing bankruptcy. Um, and the commissioner of financial institution could not go into bankruptcy court since it's all... Uh, it's, it's not public what's going on with banks. He couldn't go in and testify to that. Um, and so we dealt, we dealt with Pug Vickers. And his family was an interesting family. There was Pug Vickers. His next son was Little Pug. His third son was Doug. So it was Pug, Little Pug, and Doug. And Pug and Little Pug kind of operated together somewhat. They're, they're, they're symbiotic relationship. They work together. Doug, though, on the other hand, we kept getting email, not emails back in those days, but uh, fax letters and, and phone calls saying some of his assets are over here. You need to go look over there. Some of his assets are over here. You need to go look over here. Be really careful. This is really dangerous. So, so it was uh, it was quite interesting. It was it was very threatening down there. We spent I spent weeks of time down there. Bank officer spent weeks of time down there, and we finally got the, the bankruptcy court to uh, allow. United American Bank to foreclose on the stock. They took the stock. They tried to keep the bank open, but they couldn't keep it open. But in the meantime, in our other collection efforts, because of his other assets that he had pledged United American Bank, we had a house we were foreclosing on. The night before the foreclosure, so it burned to the ground. Uh, there were criminal proceedings going on. One of the one of the uh, uh, most important witnesses in the criminal proceedings had a hunting accident and died from his own shotgun, which is kind of hard to bend that shotgun around and cause that, but it did dropped it or something, allegedly. Um, so the bank officer was, I was working with down there, he, he stayed down there, he stayed at a little small hotel, motel, I guess is what it was, right on uh, I-40. Uh, he got, Every morning he got up and checked under his car and under his hood before he would start his engine. Uh, so he was under that kind of pressure. I, most days I drove down from Nashville rather than stay down there, but uh, uh, it was quite threatening all the time. So we, you know, it's, again, it's part of the collection process. I don't know. You know, Jim Neal used to tell the story that when he was going to courtroom prosecute Jimmy Hoffa, that Hoffa would ask Mr. Neal if he got nervous every morning when he started his car. And Jim is reported to have said that, no, he didn't worry about it because he let his wife start the car. <laughs> well, I let the bank officer start the car. Yeah. <laughs> we may have to cut that out, but uh, I, was, I was told that on good authority. Um we, we'll get back to your uh, law business in a minute, but I, I don't want to leave out some things that you've done that are apart from that that are very interesting. And one of those is a, a charitable concern known as Habitat for Humanity. Tell us what that is first and then what your involvement has been. Habitat for Humanity. It, it's now called Habitat for Humanity for Greater Nashville. Uh, includes Davidson County, but also Robertson, Wilson, um, Cheatham. I think one more, I forget what it was. And uh, so the purpose of organization is to provide uh, affordable housing for people to turn their life around, to, to, to establish themselves in, in, in a place where they can raise their children in comfort uh, and go for life. It's not a free housing. They have to pay for the housing themselves. So they have to qualify for the housing. Then they've got to take about, a, it's about a two year process. From the time you qualify financially, that you can pay for housing. It's a low, low interest rate, sometimes zero interest rate loans to afford the housing. Then you have to go through classes. Uh, they used to use, um, um, uh, they use different classes. They, they learn how to uh, balance their books, how to manage the money, how to take care of a house. Uh, they go through a series of classes. Then they have to go out, help build their own house. They have to put 100 hours of sweat equity in. 
their own house or somebody else's house out there before they get, they get they sign they actually sign the title sign their mortgage and get a key to the property uh during during its existence uh here in Nashville Nashville you know uh, habitat for humanity in greater Nashville uh they've built over a thousand houses wow and it, you know it's really meant for first time buyer to give them a home where they can establish their family life and they can go forward and be a, a productive member of our society and our community. Um, again, they got to qualify everything they go through to qualify. I've been engaged with them for about 20 years now. How did you first get started on this? I just initially I just did some builds with them. They, they have they they do they bring volunteers in to do the build. Um, and I just started doing some volunteer beers builds once a year, with law firm I was with, or a group I was with, mostly law firms, we just made one build a year. It wasn't, I wasn't very attached to them or anything. I just went out and worked for, for eight hours and uh, and built. And then it went along starting about 12, 14 years ago. Uh, they asked me to join their advisory board, and I did. And then the advisory board, they asked me to join their finance committee, which I did. And then from the finance committee, they asked me to become uh, chairman of the finance committee, uh, or, which would be a their, that would be treasurer in their legal organization, which I said, okay. Uh, then they asked me to join the board. Uh, so at that point, I was a member of the board. Uh, I served a six-year term of board. In fact, my service with the board ends this December, this uh, 2023. Um, and then so I was on the executive committee because I was uh, treasurer. And so I've been on the executive committee for the last six years. Um, and I've just now been asked, uh, the board voted for me to start in 2024 uh, to be the co-chair, the, the rising chair, they call it co-chair for 2024, come chair of, uh, chairman of, of Habitat in 2025, and then I'll be past chair in 2026. So, which, uh, so I, I organize and build once a year, our law firm builds a house every year, hmm. usually joined her with another one of our clients, usually a bank client to go out and work we contribute towards the bill. We go out and do sweat equity to uh, help. We, um, we participate in the various fundraising. I participate in various fundraising functions of the habitat from, uh, I don't present the golf tournament because I couldn't hit a golf ball straight if I wanted to. But they have other things um, that I participate in and raise money for. No frog jumping. No frog jumping. That I, I'll suggest that now, mm -hmm. now that I'm on the uh, executive committee again. Okay. Um, but... Um, and so I've been doing all this for a long time, and I really love working with them. They're great people out there. Uh, yeah. the, the head of the Habitat is a former bike officer, Danny Heron, which I've known for years. They've got, oh, yeah. they got a great, great group of uh, senior leadership out there and the people to work with. Um, and so it, it is a huge business. It is unlike, <coughs> excuse me, it's unlike any other nonprofit I know about because it's not, all, it's not only a nonprofit raise money and do good things like build these houses but it 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 is is a is a builder it holds its own mortgages services its own mortgages um now it's got what's called a restore which um it operates in conjunction with action building houses that where overruns of people from lowe's or home depot or a builder contribute uh and they sell them uh retail so what they got their retail and they raise money from that and that goes into the coffer so Money comes in to fund us. I mean, this is a this is a sixty seventy million dollar organization. Okay, they own they own their own. Uh, they bought several years ago. They bought the old Kmart at the corner of Knowlesville Road and uh, Harding Place. Harding Place. Mm -hmm. they, they refurbished that into their corporate offices. They they, they did all the calculations. Feel like that was the best thing they could do monetarily. It's turned out great. Then half that old Kmart building they've turned into the restore, sure. where they have. Filled with all kinds of windows, doors, lamps, shades, furniture, and everything to get them in. Like. They also have a restore in um, Dixon County, small restore in Dixon County. And they're they are building. Uh, they've had one, but they're now building a new one in Wilson County, where the old um, outlet mall was. Just as you get into Wilson County, over if you go on I forty towards Knoxville, it was on the right hand side. And you went left towards over to Lebanon. They're they're going they're building a, a new one there. There'll be a good size restore too, and that contributes. So they they get. They get funding from government sources to build houses. They get funding from private sources. Uh, they raise money for contributions. 
like when our we do a build, uh, that money goes goes towards the cost of uh, the build and construction uh, and the overhead for uh, for habitat. And so all that comes together, let them do all that they do. They, they're really struggling right now in Davidson County because the price of land is so high. Right. I was so, going to ask about that. How do they get the land? Well, they, they, they of course, in, in the last recession, they got, they, got, uh, they got several pieces of land that they put aside uh, at a very low price. Um, they, they tried last year, they tried something new. Uh, they've always had standalone homes. Uh, they're usually two or three bedroom homes. Most of these families are pretty good sized families. Um, and uh, they tried townhomes, which is a completely different thing than what they've done before. Uh, and it worked okay. Uh, you get you get more homes on a smaller amount of acreage. Uh, so it works. So it, that's always an alternative. They still prefer to do single family homes if they can. Um, and so they, so they, they look for, uh, you know, pieces of property they can get at a, a fair value that the math will work um and it's, it's getting harder and harder in davidson county to make that work they've got they've got they've got enough inventory of land to go out two three four years now now it just so happens that a couple of days ago um the former first lady of america rosalind carter passed away and everybody knows that she and jimmy carter uh the president former president were very active did you ever have any uh connection with them or get to know them in this project? I did. They, they came to Nashville in 2019 for the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter build. Uh, and that was a project that they, Habitat was building 20, 25 homes. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they, they, they're, they're also close friends are um, Trish Yearwood and uh, um, Garth, right? Garth Brooks. Garth Brooks. They all, so they all came out and they built. And so Jimmy and Rosalind were out there working every day. Now they didn't work all day, but they were out there working and they were working under a tent. I was going to ask if it's hot. Did President Carter actually work? He did. He did. Uh, they set him up. I mean, and uh, and Rosalind both, they, they were there. He was there hammering and doing all those kind of things, but mm -hmm. they made it easy on him because he, he was still, he was already in his 80s. That was, that was 2019. Right. Uh, and he worked out there for a whole week. And yes, I worked out there. Not alongside him, but on one of the other homes right across the street from where he was working. Okay. Very good. Um, any other pastimes, hobbies, or extracurricular activities you'd like to tell us about? Well, growing up, there was there was two family activities we always participated in. Uh, one was boating. Uh, my father had a boat in Chattanooga on Chickamauga Lake when I was born. When I was on the boat first time when I was six years old, and so summer weekends from from first warm weather in April or May until start of football season, uh, we were almost always on Chickamauga Lake on the boat. Uh, we took we took some trips down the Tennessee River, took trips up the Tennessee River. Uh, spent you know down Tennessee River with a ten day trip. Up we usually just went up to Watts Bar and spent a week a long weekend or something at Watts Bar. Uh, Other is football. My my grandfather being uh, the football player he was. He was also on the board of trustees in University of Tennessee, and he was athletic representative on the board of trustees. So he was very much into UT football. So he started taking my father every, in the fall to all football games uh, when my father was six years old. My father started taking me, my father and grandfather and mother, started taking me when I was six years old. I started taking my kids when they were four years old. Um, my kids started taking their grandkids when they were four years old. So it's kind of a family tradition at the ball game. We used to have we used to have eight season tickets on the 50-yard line in Knoxville. Under the upper deck, I let them go out of frustration from of the management, athletic director, and other reasons about eight years ago. And I kind of regret that at times, but um, but had a lot of had a lot of great, had real great travel experiences with them. Uh, the thing I remember most about uh, the travel with my grandfather was the 1956 Sugar Bowl. Uh, Johnny Majors was our single wing tailback tailback at that time. So the train, we, we rode a train to New Orleans. Uh, and my father, myself, my You're mother, 10 years old. I was 10 years old. Uh, I always started going to ballgame until I was six years old. But 10 years old, we went, we went down by train, stayed on a Pullman car uh, somewhere in New Orleans. I couldn't pick up where. Went over to the hotel where the, the players and the coaches were. And of course, grandfather introduced me to Johnny Majors and, uh, and to the head coach. And, I uh, went to the ball game with Johnny Majors, fumbled, and we lost the ball game because his fumble was a punt. 
but anyhow, it's still, I still love Johnny Majors, and uh, uh, I, that, that was just a great trip, and we used to, we used to travel to away games a lot, the Tennessee used to play Georgia Tech back in those days, used to play North Carolina in those days, um, used to travel to all those ball games uh, during the season, in addition to all the home games. All right. And there's still a boat owner, I believe. Still a boat owner. I, Where is that? I have. I now have like like clear water, uh, than than lakes in Tennessee. So I now have a boat in uh, South Florida that I try to get down to as often as I can. Okay. Now uh, I did want to circle back to the the law business. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the firm of Bone McAllister Norton uh, changed its name. Tell us about that. Well, we didn't change our name. We merged with a law firm. Well, I have a card that says Spencer Payne. Was it, is that not a change? Well, it, it is, but it's not. We didn't, it's, it's not. It's no longer the phone with Council Nord. We didn't change the corporate entity. I see. All uh, right. Tell us. We, about we merged it. with Spencer Payne. Um, Maybe I don't understand it. Go we, ahead. We merged with Spencer Payne, which is a was at that time a 450 person law firm, uh, primarily out of Kansas City, um, and they. Locally here, they call it uh, Spencer Payne Bone McAllister just to keep the, the name in it. Um, and we so everybody in the national office joined and they were either partners, uh, associates, or of counsel. Um, you and I are of counsel. Okay. Well, uh, don't say, uh, what, what's the mandatory retirement age at the Spencer Payne law firm? I don't, don't know if they have a mandatory retirement age. They do have an age above, above which you can't be a partner, which is 70. <laughs> so we, you and I have both passed that age. So we, so I, I'm not sure being a counsel was not a better gig. I think it might be. Uh, so that was October 1, effective October 1 of 2021. Yeah. Correct. And, and a couple of years ago, you got your 50-year award. I did. Or emeritus award uh, from the National Bar Association. And yet you're still in the office uh, pretty much every day. So tell us what you think about the idea of retirement. I, I've talked about that. Every, every, every day somebody asks me, when am I going to retire? I just, I just haven't made that decision yet. Yes. Well, uh, no, no need to make it prematurely. No. All right. Not. Now, Mac, we've talked about a lot of things, uh, and I'm giving you now the opportunity to mention anything that I have left out or that you just want to be sure got into this uh, oral history today. Well, I think we talked a little bit about it. So my, my practice... But uh, evolved. So I've got what I call recession proof practice. Okay. Tell and, us what that means. Well, first and foremost, after I was appointed to the panel of trustees in 1979, for 17 years, I was an active member of the panel of trustees. Uh, after that, I, I was appointed on some various cases. And, and after that, so I, I really operated as a trustee probably until um, for 20 years or so, uh, which would. Uh, and so got a lot of relationships there. Mostly I've represented uh, lenders after that, after that, uh, in, in bankruptcy case with chapter 7, 11, 12, 13. Um, so that's most of my experience goes there. And then uh, back in the hate, the, so recession proof practice. In good times, I do commercial loan documents for my clients. I advise them on their issues to loan large commercial loan documents. Uh, review documents, um, and I've been doing a lot of that for the last few years. Um, in the height of the recession in 2008, I had a booming uh, collection business. I had three lawyers working with me, um, and we did uh, workouts, restructures, collections, foreclosures. Um, and there, there were times during that period of time, those few years right through there, um, that uh, we did as many as 50 or 60 foreclosures a quarter. Um, and it seems like the bank always waited towards the end of the quarter to tell us we don't want these done at the end of this quarter. Uh, we always accomplish what they asked us to do, but it was, a, it was a heavy workload. Well, it's a legal maxim in Nashville that if it weren't for the last minute, nothing would get done. <laughs> That's true. You agree? I agree. Well, what was interesting in our early practice before they changed the uh, um, they changed the tax laws where it's not as important to conclude transactions by the end of the calendar tax year as it used to be back in the um, 70s and 80s. Uh, we used to close more transactions in December than we closed any other three months of the year. 
And normally we work on New Year's Eve until until we were through closing transactions. Sometimes we had multiple conference rooms going, uh, closing transactions um, by end of the year to meet clients' needs and their tax needs. Uh, and we close one transaction, leave one conference room, go down the hall, high five lawyers. We went down the hall and go close another transaction in another office. Uh, we don't have don't have the same pressures anymore, but that was but uh, uh, that was that was a lot of fun. Okay. Well, and then it's been fun, hasn't it? It has. It's been it's been a good ride. It's been a good ride, and you're still right. I'm still right. I wouldn't do anything different. Thank you so much for being here today and letting everybody know uh, a lot more than they probably knew before about Matt McAllister. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.